everyone and welcome to the Curious Geographer brought with you in collaboration with Time for Geography and Edge Hill University. I am so excited um, about our live interview today which is going to be with Dr Joanne Egan and we're going to be talking about reconstructing past environments and what we can learn about volcanic eruptions. So um, Dr. Joanne Egan is a senior lecturer in physical geography at Edge Hill University and her research focuses on reconstructing past environments so that she can begin to understand the impacts of volcanoes that occurred from thousands of years ago. Joe's interest in quaternary and paleoecological techniques started first when she was at university and it is a topic which is touched upon briefly at school but it's mainly talked about university and that's when Joanne was first introduced to them which made her want to research more and more. So in tonight's interview we're going to investigate the impacts of volcanic eruptions that occurred thousands um, of years ago and also ask how geographers can go about researching um, these, like how can we actually understand what happened 4,000 years ago. There's some great links to GCSE and A-level geography, but also just general geography for everybody else who's watching. So, um, I'm gonna pass over. So, uh, Joe, you're on the screen just to say hi. And our first question for you is, can you, you first of all wanna know, like what exactly are you interested in um, and how do you go about, what do you research? So you're a quaternary scientist interested in environmental reconstruction through paleolimonology. I'm gonna keep saying it wrong because these words are so long, um, but can you please tell us what this means and what are you interested in researching? Oh, hold on. So I'm um, gonna yeah, go. Yep. <laughs> so I'm really interested in the Quaternary period. So you all know that we've had lots of different geological periods in time. And the Quaternary period is looking at the last 2.6 million years. And then that's split further into two other epochs of time, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. So the Pleistocene looks at the late, the earlier parts of the Quaternary, so 2.6 million years to 10,000 years ago. And then the Holocene looks at the last 10,000 years. So I'm primarily interested in looking at what's happened in the last 10,000 years, which doesn't seem like very much time, but it is. And there's lots that has happened in that time. And we can learn a lot about it to help us understand what's going to potentially happen in the future. Brilliant. And so oh. Do you want to go ahead? And yeah. So to say, um, so in terms of volcanic eruptions, um, we know that they do happen, and we know that they have all kinds of consequences. So by looking at sediments in different lakes, which is what paleolimnology is, then I can start to understand what's actually potentially going to be the environmental impact of volcanic eruptions in the future as well. Let's start with kind of how um, students might have heard about this in school and then we'll go into a bit more depth in your own research. So in school students learn, um, when they learn about the long term um, causes of climate change, they look at how volcanic eruptions can sometimes lead to global cooling or global dimming and that can impact our climate. Um, so. From, but they learn about it very, very briefly in terms of that's a natural cause of climate change. So would you mm -hmm. mind actually telling us um, as a um, senior lecturer in geography, how do volcanic eruptions actually influence our climates? Yeah, OK, so there's, there's two ways that it can actually influence it. One is going to be quite rare. The other one is the more common way it influences it. So I'll talk about the rare one first. So Volcanoes can actually cause global warming, but when you think about anthropogenic warming, the volcanoes are very, very limited in terms of that. So there's two gases that um, in particular are released that are the important climate gases. One of them being carbon dioxide, the other one being sulfur dioxide. So in terms of the carbon dioxide, to give you a sense as to how much 
um, carbon dioxide can be released in an eruption. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will have learnt about Mount St Helens in 1980. So to give you a sense as to how much carbon dioxide was released during that, it was about 0.01 gigatons. Now, if you compare that to the amount of carbon dioxide that is released annually from worldwide road transportation, that's actually equivalent to 5.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So that's just thinking about, you know, our vehicles. So if you then think about all of the fossil fuels that we're burning and all of those activities that are creating those greenhouse gases, volcanoes only really emit a tiny, tiny amount of carbon dioxide in comparison. However, in the past, there have been particular types of eruptions that have generated enough carbon dioxide to cause significant global warming. And one of those events actually caused a mass extinction event during the Permian period. So that was around 252 million years ago, and it was eruptions in the Siberian traps actually caused that. Now, I'm not really interested in that side of things. I'm more interested in looking at what's happening in terms of what does the sulfur dioxide cause? And it's the sulfur dioxide that will tend to cause global cooling. So what happens is the volcano will erupt all of these different gases, including sulfur dioxide, and then those sulfur dioxide particles, they will actually start to react with water vapour in the atmosphere. And what happens in that reaction is we then get sulfur dioxide, that, sorry, um, sulfuric acid that is generated. That sulfuric acid aerosol will then create a scattering effect when we have incoming solar radiation. So it will, there will be lots and lots of particles in the atmosphere. They will remain there for several years. And then what we'll find is that the incoming solar radiation won't be able to reach the Earth quite as effectively because a lot of it will be scattered back into the atmosphere through that sulfur, sulfuric acid aerosol being there. So then that can generate cooling. Now, it seems like quite a modest amount of cooling. So um, the eruption that I've been studying in particular was the eruption of Mount Mazama, which happened about 7,600 years ago. It's now known as Crater Lake, um, but that particular eruption only caused a decline in temperatures of about 0.7 degrees Celsius. I say only because it does seem like a small amount, but that is enough to tip some ecosystems over the edge. So it's still a significant amount. And that glow, that cooling lasted for about one to three years. Now, in terms of how extensive that is actually felt, it depends on where the volcano actually erupts. So if you have a volcano that erupts in the northern hemisphere, then you're going to find that you'll have the cooling actually happening within the northern hemisphere only. Whereas if you have an eruption that's happening around the equator, then it would actually cause global cooling. So it does depend where in the world the volcanic eruption actually happens as to how extensive that cooling is, but that cooling can happen. That's brilliant. And that's so much more in depth than, um, as I said, students learn about just some volcanoes ca causing global cooling, but actually you're talking about the location that if it actually occurs on the um, equator, it's likely to lead to global cooling. So. Um, if students do have any questions, please just put them in the comments and I'll be able to ask them either as we go through or at the end. Um, so you've given us a little bit of detail about um, the particular volcanic eruption that um, you are particularly interested in researching as well. And we talked a little bit about cooling. How else do volcanic eruptions impact the environment? Yeah, so the eruption that I'm talking about probably doesn't mean that much to you in terms of where in the world it is. So Mount Mazama um, is now known as Crater Lake, which is based in Oregon. And when that erupted, it released a huge amount of volcanic ash, which is also known as tephra. That volcanic ash deposited over a really extensive area of North America. It kind of blew its way over in a northeasterly direction and it covered much of the Pacific Northwest of North America, but we've also found some volcanic ash as far as Newfoundland in Canada and it's also been found in the Greenland ice cores as well. So it's been a really, really extensive volcanic deposit. And really it's the volcanic ash that 
I would be very much interested in in terms of what happens around the environment. So we can look at what's happening right next to a volcano, which will be kind of the proximal impacts where you do get your lahars and pyroclastic flows. And that's going to obviously, you know, kill everything around it. But the further you go away, we start to question, well, what is the actual impact? And that's where the volcanic ash will become more important. So if you look at the more distal locations, which might be hundreds of kilometres away, then what we'll actually find is that the impacts can be quite variable on different environments. So I've, I've especially looked at the impact on vegetation in a forest, but also looking at the chemistry of a lake as well. And I've been um, trying to figure out how extensive that ash deposit is but also does the thickness of that ash deposit mean that you're going to get different impacts? So for example, um, I did my research in um, a, a forest area within Washington state, which is about 500 kilometers away from Crater Lake. So it's a, you know, a distance away from it. It's not anywhere nearby. Nobody around Washington state would have known that that volcanic um, eruption had happened apart from a little bit of ash that was falling. And that ash deposit it varies in thickness, but around the area that I was looking at, it was about five centimetres thick. So, you know, it's, it's not a huge amount, probably about that much. But that is enough to actually bury some vegetation. So it would kill off all of the grasses because it would bury it. It would stop photosynthesis happening for those species. But then even for some tree species, what would happen is then um, the volcanic ash would sit on the leaves and if it was raining, which is often quite common after you've had volcanic eruptions, is it would cause like a cement on the leaves and that would stop any gas exchanges happening. So again, it would stop photosynthesis and it would block the stomata. So it would actually prevent growth of some vegetation and potentially kill some vegetation as well. So it means that you get different environmental impacts in terms of that vegetation, dependent on how thick is that volcanic ash, but also how well can some of those species re-establish themselves? Because even though the grasses can become completely buried by the ash, what can happen is that they grow these weird roots where it shoots through and then it can start to re-establish itself. So eventually it can recolonize, but for some species it just completely kills them off. So I just think that's quite interesting. And then when I was looking at the lakes, I wanted to know, well, how did it impact the vegetation on the lakes, but also what happened with the water? And so the volcanic ash, it can introduce lots of new nutrients into the lake, which might be really great for some species. Some vegetation might thrive with those new nutrients, but it also might be too much for some species. So you may see a complete change in dynamics in that area. Um, and what we also may find is that because the volcanic ash sometimes is quite acidic, all of a sudden you've got acidification of the lake, which can actually kill quite a lot of species off as well. Wow, there's a lot of research that's, um, that you've like done on this. I think one quick question for me is why that location do you have, is it just that you were interested in it? Why have you particularly focused on this um, volcanic eruption? So that particular volcanic eruption um, is really important in North America because it is one of the biggest eruptions that they've had, certainly in the Holocene, and it is one of the most extensive volcanic ash layers that have been found. So there has been quite a lot of research already done, but a lot of the research um, has really conflicting arguments. So some will say that it's caused acidification of a lake. Some will say that it, it didn't at all. Some will say that it killed certain species off. And it was just so variable that we just need to understand, well, why do you have different impacts in different locations? Is it the different sensitivities of those specific locations or is it something to do with how much ash was deposited? Because it really is quite variable. There's some areas where they receive 20 centimetres of ash. And so you would expect that maybe those locations would actually have huge impacts compared to my area, which only received five centimetres, but I still did see some impacts. So when you think about moving into the future and how an Icelandic eruption, for example, might impact a farming area, it's useful to know, well, how much ash is going to be detrimental to those agricultural areas. 
Yeah, brilliant. And I'm hoping that we will talk a bit more maybe after we understand how you research it about how it can be useful for um, future um, up eruptions and understanding impacts um, in terms of maybe reducing impacts. So we'll talk about the future in a bit and any questions, just put them in the comments on the side, everyone who's watching. Um, so um, how do you go about researching volcanic eruptions that are thousands of years ago? And if you've mentioned about five centimetres of ash, like how do you actually find that out as a geographer? Mm -hmm. So as a geographer, we like to explore quite a bit anyway. Um, so I knew that the ash deposit was really, really extensive. So I kind of just had to choose a location where there wasn't much work being done in it so far, but so that I was quite confident that I was going to find the volcanic ash. And you really do go in quite blind. And I say that because what I had to do was go to Washington um, I had to jump on a little wooden raft with a team and we used a coring device, which is basically a device that we send into the water and then through into the sediments below. And we, uh, we extract several meters of sediments. So I ended up at taking six meters worth of sediments out of the lake. And they're in these little um, guttering tubes almost. And we can then see what the vol what the um, lake sediment actually looks like. So straight away, you can see whether you've got volcanic ash or not, because it looks very, very different to all of the other types of sediments. So in my core, it was very much dark organic sediments either side of the volcanic ash layer, which was actually really, really gray in color. And that was really interesting because straight away we knew that we had volcanic ash but then we had to try and figure out well where is the ash layer come from and how do we know that it is actually from Mount Mazama so you can utilize lots of different really high-tech equipment to identify the geochemistry of the volcanic ash and every single eruption has a certain geochemical signature so then we're able to match the geochemistry of the volcanic ash with the geochemical signature from that particular volcano. So we knew then that it was definitely from Mount Mazama, but then we needed to be sure that we were looking at the right time period as well. So we used radiocarbon dating of the organic of the organic material above and below the volcanic ash layer to determine what the age of the sediments were. So we knew exactly which eruption we were looking at. So once we've established that, we then need to figure out well, what actually happens after that eruption. So this is where we start to utilize microfossils within the core. So we can look at changes below the sediments, which are basically the pre-eruption sediments, and we can look at changes after the eruption, so after the volcanic ash layer, and that's after the volcanic eruption. And we can utilize things like pollen and diatoms. So I'll let you know what a diatom is in a moment, but if we start off with pollen. So pollen, as you know, is the stuff that makes you sneeze during the spring and the summer seasons, but lots of vegetation will obviously give off pollen and it's all wind blown, but it does get deposited in lake sediments. And within that, we can extract those pollen grains and look at individual grains. And it does require quite a lot of time of being sat looking through a microscope, identifying the different types of pollen and trying to figure out what species you're looking at and then literally counting the different types of pollen grains that we come up with. So we try and aim for kind of 300 individual pollen grains and then we try and establish, well, what were the most common species before the event and what were the most common species after the event? Did we see any shift in those species? Did anything decline? Did anything increase? So we can do that with the pollen and that will tell us how the vegetation has, has essentially been affected. But then we can also look at something called diatoms. So I imagine that nobody has ever heard of diatoms before. I always ask this question and it's always a no. So I'm going to assume nobody knows what they are. So diatoms are algae that live anywhere where there's water and they're made up of silica. Now, these algae are really, really special. I do love them. They're very pretty to look under the microscope, but they are microscopic. But the best way I can describe these is um, if you are in a river and you pick up a pebble out of the river, there's often quite a funny slime on that. 
that will actually be made up of algae, which includes the diatoms. So next time you pick up a pebble out of the river, you feel that slime, you know you've probably got some diatoms in your hand. So the diatoms are actually really important because they're also photosynthetic and they actually produce about a quarter of the oxygen that we breathe. Now, nobody, nobody's ever heard of them, and yet they're so important. But what is really, really interesting about diatoms is that they have particular environments and um, preferences for the type of place where they want to live. So you'll get some diatoms that will prefer more acidic waters. You'll get some diatoms that will prefer to have certain nutrient concentrations. You'll get some that will like certain temperatures of water. Some might like to live on vegetation that is submerged within the water. Some might like to bury themselves within the sediments. So there's a whole host of different types of diatoms. There's thousands and thousands of different species, but they all have these really specific preferences. So in the same way that we've done with the pollen, we can extract those diatoms out of the sediment core and look at the diatom species before the volcanic eruption and also after the volcanic eruption and see if there is any difference between the species that we're getting. And if we notice that we've got a shift, for example, from um, a very kind of neutral water loving species in terms of acidity, they prefer neutral waters, but then all of a sudden we've got a shift to species that actually prefer more acidic waters, then we can make an argument that it must have caused acidification of the lake. And that's what we actually found with the eruption from Mount Mazama. We found that the lake became slightly more acidic, but we also found that with the vegetation, there were some species that actually declined, but other species that increased. And the species that increased um, they weren't the type of species that the diatoms like to live on so we found that those particular types of diatoms they decreased but what we also found is that with the amount of volcanic ash that was added into the lake it meant that there was more sediments for certain diatom species to actually live on which then we saw certain species that like that type of environment start to increase as well. So it ends up quite a complicated picture where you end up with certain species increasing, some decreasing, but once you analyse the types of environments that those species like, you can start to paint a really nice picture as to well, what the impact actually was. That was really interesting and really for something that's quite complicated and as which students learn maybe at university really clearly explained. So thank you very much for sharing that in such an articulate way. Um, really thinking about kind of what was it like before and then what was it like after and using those to kind of understand um, how the environment was. Um, in terms of, does, does that, is it harder to tell whether there was actually global cooling or warming? Is that possible to tell from looking at these sediment cells as well and how would you tell at the actual temperatures um, in the area? Yeah, so you can actually tell by looking at the sediments alone. So you can actually um, measure the amount of organic matter in the sediments and you would assume that if there is more organic matter that you must be in a slightly warmer and more moist climate whereas if you've got more mineralogenic sediments then you would assume that it must be a slightly cooler and drier environment so instantly you can already look at that by just looking at the sediments and you can sometimes even see that with the color um, so in some sediment cores that I've had, we've had really, really grey sediments that have transitioned into brown sediments. And that's basically been a glacial into an interglacial period. So you can see that. I think with the volcanic eruptions, because the temperature change is so modest, I mean, for this eruption, we said it was only 0.7 degrees Celsius in terms of that temperature drop. You don't necessarily see that in those sediments. However, you can see sometimes in diatoms, dependent on how sensitive that environment is. So the lake that I was looking at, it was um, only a few hundred meters above sea level. But if I was to choose one of the alpine lakes, so that was much higher up in altitude, then that temperature decrease would obviously have a bigger impact. And potentially you could find that that, that water would have been frozen at some point. And so the diatoms that prefer those warmer environments, they probably would have decreased. But I haven't done it in a lake where that temperature 
would have actually really been um, signalled in those lake sediments. But it is possible to do that. Um, it is quite challenging to know exactly how much the temperature has dropped. Um, you can do some clever maths and try and work it out, but it isn't perfect, so it is only an estimation. Um, and then earlier you mentioned about, mentioned about how this can be used in the future to understand potential um, volcanic eruptions that may occur. So would you mind telling us what would be the what's the use in looking at past environments and past volcanic eruptions how can that be used in terms of future volcanic eruptions yes certainly so i guess one of the biggest questions that we have is well what would be the impact on humans because that's what we, we you know we want to look after ourselves um so we'd have to think about well if we have a huge amount of volcanic ash that's deposited is that going to potentially impact various agricultural settings? So thinking about crops, if you have 10 centimetres worth of volcanic ash, that could potentially just kill off all of the crops, which would have economic problems, but then also it could lead to problems in terms of food security. But even when we think about water security as well, you know, we do rely on fresh water bodies for water resources and drinking water and in some locations that water is going to be much less available than in other locations i mean it's i can hear the rain outside right now i don't think it's a problem for us but certainly in places like the mediterranean for example they are sometimes restricted in their water so if all of a sudden you've then got a volcanic eruption that's deposited a whole amount of volcanic ash in some of their water supplies they have various reservoirs, for example, then that becomes a problem and they have to somehow treat that water. Um, so thinking about food security and water security in particular, understanding how the volcanic eruptions in the past have potentially had those impacts will be really important. But then also thinking about the environment as well. So um, thinking about how acidified water bodies can become and how that might impact on fish species and um, how that might impact on biodiversity of many of, of these environments, all of that will be important. And then also when we think about climate change as well, I mean, I haven't done much research on to, in terms of looking at the temperature changes, but certainly more research can be done on that. And that will be really important when we think about the influence of volcanoes with climate change. You know, do we have the potential for volcanoes to actually reduce the impact of our global warming? Probably not. We need a lot of volcanoes to erupt to be able to counteract the amount of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases pumping into the atmosphere. But there is potential that we can kind of counteract some of those. But just understanding that climate interaction will be really important. Um, and I guess as well, thinking about how volcanic ash is actually spread. I mean, this was a volcano in Oregon and I was looking at impacts 500 kilometers away, but we've also found that volcanic ash in Greenland. So understanding just how far some of these impacts can be felt will be really important as well. Brilliant. And that is a fantastic transition into Isla's question, um, who actually asked about um, volcanic eruptions, saying, "Could can volcanic eruptions indirectly contribute to global warming? So I think she's kind of asking, if ash could ash settle on ice sheets and would potentially that stop lights reflecting and then um, means that there'd, there'd be more warming? Is that something that could happen? I know you said your main focus wasn't climate change, but... Yeah. No, it's a really interesting point and it's a good way to think about it. Um, I mean, in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide that would be released, it's a minimal amount to contribute to global warming. But um, that suggestion that you made about the volcanic ash sitting on top of ice sheets, um, there is good potential for that. But I think one of the main issues that we've got is that when we have volcanoes that erupt close to ice bodies, then you tend to find, certainly, for example, in Iceland, you tend to find that the ice will melt very quickly as well. If it was a volcano that had erupted you know, much further away, then there is potential for that volcanic ash to sit on top of the glacier. And it could potentially reduce the amount of um, 
ice that can then accumulate because it, it might generate some melting. But I think it would be minimal in terms of the amount of anthropogenic activities. I don't think it would counteract it enough to really have a big influence. Brilliant. Thank you for answering that. Um, let's go on to one of also my favourite bits of the interview, which was, would you mind sharing how you got to where you are today? And then what advice do you have for future students, well, for future, no, what advice do you have for students taking their next steps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of how I got where I am today, do you know, in all honesty, I never had a plan of how I was going to get where I am. I never thought I would get where I am. I ended up um, kind of just going along with geography because I enjoyed it. I found it really interesting and it was something that I just had a passion for. So I just carried on studying it from GCSE to A-level, went to university to study it and then just carried on wanting to learn more and more about it. And then naturally, I think because I had that curious mind, I wanted to find out more and more so I went into that research post I did that PhD to find out more but then I wanted to share that passion with everybody else so I wanted to, to teach everyone else so that's how I've ended up kind of staying in that kind of teaching role as well um, but I guess in terms of advice for students that are moving on to their next steps I would probably say just try and do something that you find interesting it's difficult to know what to do and there's no harm in not knowing what to do with your life either and um, some people have really really um straight ideas on what they want and that's great other people don't have a clue and that's fine as well so um i would just say make sure that it's something that interests you and something that you enjoy because it's true that the saying is when you enjoy a job you don't actually ever work a day in your life that is a great answer i love this part um, so I've just got one more question. I do like to ask, um, ask all the questions that come in or as many of them as possible because it's um, amazing to have an international expert kind of answering these questions. So John Paul has asked, can you please explain more about the signature of volcanic ash? So how do you know which volcano and eruption it's from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So with specific volcanoes, they have particular um, geochemical properties in their magma. So you'll find that some are really high in silica, some will have more kind of andesites in them. Basically, they have particular percentages of those. So when a volcano will erupt, it will erupt all of that magma out, but with that comes the tephra and the volcanic ash. So then the volcanic ash can be measured using something called a microprobe, which is basically a beam that's sent down onto an individual glass shard of ash. And it looks like a little piece of glass. It is microscopic, but it looks like a little piece of glass. And it will basically tell you the geochemistry of that particular glass shard. And so then you can match up the percentages of the silica that's in there or of the andesites that are in there, whatever is in there. And it should match perfectly with the volcano that you've already identified as what that geochemical signal is from that volcano. I, think, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, yeah, as, as much as I could follow, I thought that was a really good answer. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of our live interview and I just wanted to say a huge thank you um, for myself and Time for Geography as well because um, I just feel I love learning new things which kind of links to studies that, um, that students learn about or topics that students learn about um, and goes more in depth and I think you articulated some very complicated things um, so that students can access it from all different um, year groups and uh, John Paul who just answered the asked the question said yes thank you um thank so you. I just want to thank you for, and also from all the um everybody's watching us so thank you very much Sharon for taking your time um to answer all the questions um it's been a pleasure having you on here and um yeah absolutely great um, I'm just going to say, um, just a notice for everybody leaving, um, but from us, a huge thank you for being a guest on our channel. Well, thank you very much for having me and thank you very much to everyone that joined. And then for everybody else, um, this is um, up on Time for Geography, hopefully you're watching it there, you might be on YouTube at the moment, but keep update, uh, keep 
a lookout um, because we are going to do a shortened um, version which is going to pick up upon one smaller part that um, Joanne and I have spoken about. So definitely check that out on Time for Geography. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for joining. There's going to be more um, interviews coming up and we will update to you on all different social media accounts and different things like that. So definitely check that out and lovely to see so many people live today. That's it from me, everybody.